Hi, everyone, and welcome to the CHO Bulls podcast. We got an HQ edition today with me, Will Gottlieb. Follow me on Twitter at Will underscore Gottlieb and with Mark K at MK Hoops on Twitter. We've got Lawrence pushing the buttons uh, and we've got some stuff to talk about, don't we? So, Mark, how you doing? It's uh, what, 7.30 a.m. down in Australia? How, how are you feeling? Uh, sleepy, tired, uh, barely awake and all of the other things, William. I'm feeling OK, though. How are you? Well, I am doing just fine. Maybe a little bit better than Julian Phillips, who today the Bulls announced is going to be out for a little while uh, with a right foot sprain. He's, the Bulls said in their announcement that he is in a walking boot and that status will be updated as appropriate, uh, which just means that we will know when they have something to tell us, which is pretty vague. But um, I don't know. I mean... Outside of the fact that Julian has been playing a little bit better of late, he's been uh, up to about 13 minutes a game over the last 10 or so games. Um, you know, not scoring a ton, only four points per game and two rebounds, but 43% from deep. And to me, it's more about the bodies at this point. I mean, you're without Kobe White, hopefully not for too much longer. You're without Patrick Williams. Torrey Craig has been in and out of the lineup. Zach Levine, obviously Lonzo. So just not a lot of bodies out there. Mark, what was your initial take on the injury news? And, um, yeah, any any uh, just sort of comments about what you've seen from Julian Phillips of late? Well, my take was not again. Uh, my take not went, again. so my thoughts went to a bad place. Um, foot injuries haven't been kind to the Bulls more generally, but certainly this season it hasn't been great to big wings who have had four, uh, foot injuries uh, that happen to be a Chicago Bulls players. So not ideal. So my, my thoughts and immediately went to some dark, dark places, Williams. And I'm hoping that's just me being a reactionary idiot and that's not actually something that's born out or it doesn't bear itself out. I'm hoping the best for Julian because he's had a good and impressive rookie season considering the expectations that I had for him coming into the year, which to be fair, wasn't a lot. Uh, and it never should be for a second round pick. But the way he's been able to come in and look comfortable every time he's played, um, you know, I've really enjoyed what he's done this season more generally, but specifically this you know, last five to 10, 15 games, something like that, where the team has been really needed. Rotation, uh, rotational depth, like again, the fact that he's been able to come in, play good solid defense, run to the corner, and the minute he catches the ball in the pocket, just lets that thing fly from the corner. Uh, he's been, in some respects, the perfect five to 10 minute role guy in, in a lot of ways. Con again, considering the fact that he is a second round pick, this is year one, et cetera. So I've been really impressed with Julian Phillips, I'm sure as of, as has every single Bulls fan out there. But the fact that potentially his season now is ending, I won't say it's ending because we don't know a lot, but there's what, like 15 or so games to go uh, to have a right foot sprain at this time of the year, not ideal. So I just hope it's not a, a real issue. If it's the end of the season, then fine. But uh, yeah, I'm just hoping and praying that it's not a, a real issue, William. Yeah, I'm not quite there yet on this potentially ending his season. Obviously not great news and, and time is limited here. Mm -hmm. Um, but the fact that he, he's in a boot, uh, that I, I guess I was gonna say it's like similar to Patrick and obviously that didn't end well, but unless there's like a serious injury, I mean, this is just a foot sprain, right? So they're trying to immobilize it. They're trying to keep him, um, from putting too much stress and pressure onto it. And so hopefully that means he'll be able to get back in. does not sound like a serious thing. Um, but obviously we will learn more as that happens. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I kind of mentioned it like the Bulls rotation right now is just so thin. I mean, last mm. light, night without Kobe, and it doesn't sound like they'll be without Kobe for too long. We'll talk about him in a second. But you have DeRozan, Vucevic, Caruso, Desumu, and Torrey Craig starting in place of Kobe White. And then on your bench, you got 16 minutes from Drummond. You've got 17 mm. minutes from Javon Carter and Batim. And you've got 13 minutes for Dale and Terry. And so, I mean, you're basically running like a six-man rotation of guys that you actually trust that you would normally have in your rotation. And then everybody else just has to fill in. So the bulls do have a little bit of an easier road ahead here after uh, what was a really tough stretch that they handled pretty well. Um, they've got the wizards uh, tomorrow on Saturday. Then they've got the blazers, the rockets who are falling apart and having some injuries. Um, the Celtics obviously is going to be a tough one, but then the wizards again, the Pacers again, the nets. So it does uh, loosen up a little bit here, but I think obviously Julian, you know, he's, he's been 
very solid. I think he's progressed and, you know, his activity, his cutting, his three point shooting, all the stuff that you want to see out of a role guy has been really great. But, um, to me, it's like, this is a bigger issue of depth on this roster. And like, typically I would point to that being a problem with the roster construction and I'm not, not doing that, but you're missing Alonzo. You're missing Zach. You're missing, uh, Kobe Patrick. I mean, just so many guys now are out and it's really tough to, put a roster together when you've got you know two thirds or a third of it not being able to play so hopefully julian is able to get back out there soon um i think we are going to get to learn a little bit more about some of these other guys which is exciting we saw henry drell and andrew funk in garbage time last night um so maybe they get a little bit more burn but yeah just kind of a tough situation here and then the other injury news and update is kobe white obviously he was um landed on i guess we'll say uh by pascal siakam after uh, a really impressive chase down block um that put the pacers in a good position to win the game the other night obviously they did not um but siakam landed awkwardly on kobe's leg and it looked like it could have been pretty bad there at first but um you know i, I think we've hit on this for the most part uh you know woge tweeted out that he was not expected to miss too much time could possibly be back saturday uh, prior to the game yesterday, Billy Donovan said, um, it's probably this is a quote. It's probably going to be when he can start to feel more comfortable to get back to playing all the imaging came back relatively clean. He is dealing with discomfort and soreness there. So it's a matter of how quickly and soon he can get over that. So he said it was nothing severe. Um, sounds like it will not be something that holds him out too long. But again, when you've got such limited depth and, um, I think, you know, with Kobe's loss to me, like the lack of shot creation on the perimeter also really stood out. And we'll talk about that in a second here. But um, yeah, I mean, Kobe's just been such a workhorse, such an Iron Man. Uh, how worried are you about his uh, rest of season? Oh, well, look, I'm not. And and then I, I guess we started doing gloom with the Phillips injury, or at least I did. Um, you referenced all the other injuries the Bulls have sustained, which has been a long list. The fact that Kobe walked away from that with only this hip injury, which seems like it's a, a couple day thing, maybe a week type thing at most. I think that is absolutely the best case scenario that would could have been possible. Because when it happened, I thought, oh, damn, that, that that's a knee. It looked like a knee. And it, it looked like it could have been either on the left or right leg. The way he went down is like, oh, shit, that's bad. Both of those legs didn't go the right way they should be. But the fact that it's a hip thing, which is a thing that I didn't even consider when seeing that play the way it materialized um and the fact that obviously as you noted baby based on billy's wording that it came back clean that it's pretty minimal in context like yeah i'm i'm thankful that that is the case but look i i would expect kobe to get back at, at some stage pretty soon um whether he's fully right to go i doubt it but I, I the balls desperately need him the minute he can start walking injury free or pain free i suppose is probably the minute he gets back on the court and starts playing and to your point like they absolutely need him and whilst we can talk about and continue to say uh you know they're kind of locked into ninth which is kind of true i suppose um the team is still trying to get back to 500 and uh i think that would be we, we spoke about this last week like it, it ultimately doesn't mean anything because he's still ninth most likely but i think to me at least there would be a difference between between being 37 and what 44 whatever the math is whatever 37 plus something equals 82 and 41 and 41 like just it just feels and sounds different in that sense so they need kobe to do that they have a stretch of games here where they can get back to that 500 stretch or that 500 mark um they need kobe to do so because the depth is really problematic right now having one creator out there and that creator being the demar de rosen who leads the league in minutes that, that's the other thing like we can talk about all the guys that are out but because there are so many guys out, the guys that are playing have also been asked to do just so much work that they, even though they're playing, they're not you know, in, in an ideal state either themselves. So uh, it's problematic on a lot of fronts, but hopefully Kobe's back soon. Yeah, that just made me think about uh, just a quick rundown of the Eastern Conference playoff standings. I'm looking at playoffstatus.com here, uh, mm -hmm. which has uh, some pretty good projections. And actually right now, the Bulls still heavily projected to land in that ninth spot. 78% chance, um, but their, their odds of moving into eighth are actually now higher than moving down to 10th. So 11% chance at the eighth spot, 7% chance at 10, 
percent chance at seven and less than a one percent chance to miss the play-in altogether. Um, I mean, yeah. What do you think? I mean, I, I think your preseason prediction was thirty-five wins um, on mm-hmm. our roundtable. I believe mine was thirty-eight. Right now, mm-hmm. they are thirty-two and thirty-five. Like, what? How do you think they'll finish out here? Just uh, last couple of games, I can read down the schedule. It's Washington, Portland at home, Houston on the road, Boston, Washington, Indiana back at home, Brooklyn, Minnesota on the road, Atlanta, and New York at home at Orlando versus. New York at home, and then a three-game road trip to end the season at Detroit, at Washington, at New York. Um, you think they can get back up to 500? Do you think they get there? Or do you think um, just with the injuries catching up to guys, even though they've played a lot better of late and they're kind of trending that way, do you think it'll be too hard to to catch them? I mean, right now, like I said, 32 and 35, so they're still three games back, and it just kind of feels like they're always three games away. Well, by my count, at least, there's at least seven, maybe eight games uh, against teams that are under 500. So you've got the Wizards three times, I think. You've got the the Blazers, uh, the Rockets. Um, there's a game against the Nets and the Pistons in there as well. And as you get towards the end of the season when you've got a couple games against the Knicks to sort of conclude the year, like what, what team, what version of the Knicks are you playing? Like the last game of the season is at New York. Are the Knicks, is Tibbs doing the Tibbs thing where every guy is getting 40 to 45 minutes or are they resting players because of uh, playoffs at that point, like trying to get their guys rest? So I guess it's possible, and particularly with the fact that you've got so many games against lesser teams, let's say, uh, they won't necessarily win all of those eight or nine games or whatever it is against those below 500 teams. But if they can get most of them, you've already amassed 32 wins, then yeah, you have a real chance to get to 500, particularly if, like I said, some of those better teams like the Knicks or the Magic, whomever it may be, if they start resting their players towards the end of the season. I, you also got a game against the Hawks, which I didn't mention. Uh, another below 500 team. So there really is scope here to get there. And we spoke about this last week, but because they went three on one on that road trip out west uh, the other week, that's sort of gave, given them that opportunity to get back to 500. Whereas if they went, you know, 0 and 4 or 1 and 3 on that West Coast road trip, then we're not talking and we're not having this conversation. Which again, maybe it doesn't really matter. Who really cares? Because you're probably locked into ninth regardless. But I, I do think getting back to 500 with the level of turnover, roster roster turnover, the level of injuries, the noise that was around this team in the first you know one to one to two months, the fact that you started five and fourteen, no Lonzo, the whole Zach thing. I think it would be a mini triumph, for, to be honest with you, if this team got back to 500. Again, noting the fact that how just how, how how tested the depth of this roster has been. So I'm kind of hoping for it at this stage. It would be nice to see. I was predicting 35 wins, as you noted, but that was based on the fact that there would be some inner turmoil. Um, one of DeMar or Zach would be traded. That everything would implode. In some respects, that has happened because you've been without Zach for much of the year. You, your roster has been completely uh, you know, redone in, in, in a lot of respects. So there, there has been some in a turmoil in, in that regard, maybe not the way that I expected, but the fact that they're on still on track to, to exceed 35, 35 wins. Like I keep saying this, William, but like the players and coaches deserve so much credit for the way they've turned this season around. And maybe it doesn't ultimately mean or change anything because you're probably going to finish ninth anyway, but I still think it's commendable. Yeah. And I feel like AK will be pretty pleased with that too, right? Oh, like he's going to be kind of touting the ability for this team to, you know, get through and persevere to where they could come back from a nine game below 500 stretch and get back into it. I I do think it would be impressive. Um, The projection models aren't quite there with you yet. Uh, Bulls on ESPN BPI projected for 39.2 wins. So 39 and 43, essentially basketball reference. um, They have the Bulls at 39 and 43 as well. And then based on their point differential, which is minus 2.5 right now, uh, it's only 34 wins. So they are outperforming expectations based on the quality of play. I think that number probably changes if you uh, just look at how they've played since that 5-14 and stretch and obviously a much different team right now. So like if you prorate that over the remaining however many games, then they look a lot better. But, um, you know, their expected win total right now is... uh, three wins above what they actually have, I believe. Um, or they're, the difference in wins is 3.6 higher than what their point differential would suggest. So that right now they should be 
like a 30, a 29 win team, but they're 32. So uh, they have been overperforming, I think, more than they've been underperforming this year, which is kind of crazy considering how it all started. Um, but yeah, I, I do think there's a real possibility that they get back to 500. I honestly think they could get above, like the remaining schedule is just so bad. And then you mentioned like the last couple weeks of the season, like are the Knicks still going to be tossing for home court advantage? If so, I think they'll be trying. If not, Maybe not, but you're going to have like the Pistons and the Wizards uh, sandwiched in between those two Knicks games. You get the Magic, who are probably going to be trying still for playoff seeding. Um, Minnesota Timberwolves are not going to be uh, tanking, although they've they're missing Cat and they have not been playing as well of late. So, kind of an interesting stretch coming up. I think the Bulls will probably be one of the teams that's still trying the most, um, but we shall see. Let's take a quick break and get a word in from our sponsors and then get back to talking about how they've looked. Um, and I want to focus in on Io a bit here because he had uh, a pretty interesting game last night and Billy had some interesting comments about it too. So uh, first we will tell you about our friends Chevy because during their March Radness sales event, they have the best offers of the year. So make your way to Ray Chevrolet on Route 12 in Fox Lake to join in on the savings. One of the top selling Chevy dealers in the Midwest, you'll always be able to find and shop one of Chicagoland's largest Chevy inventories. They're the perfect tailgate vehicles. We obviously have bear season coming up. And Mark, I need to get your take on the Keenan Allen trade. We will talk about that later. Um, but they've got the perfect tailgate vehicles waiting at the Ray Chevy during truck month. For a limited time, they're offering 0% financing for 72 months. 0% financing for 72 months on new Silverados with over 100 available. And they've got 125 vehicles under $20,000. Seriously, you guys, can pricing get any more affordable? Everyone loves the word free. And that's also exactly what you'll get this month at Ray Chevrolet and Fox Lake, a free oil change. All you need to do is mention CHGO when scheduling your oil change, start off the new year right, and schedule it by April 1st. Visit Ray Chevrolet in Fox Lake or RayChevrolet.com. They've been serving the community since 1963. Ray Chevrolet, find new roads. Thank you, William. And I want to tell everyone about prize picks. I need to announce enunciate that a little bit better because I got some feedback last week, William, that uh, maybe my Australian accent wasn't very clear with that, but it is prize picks, friends. Do it in Not American sure accent. Prize... Can you hear that? What was prize that? Prize picks. Prize picks. What's your American Prize accent? picks. Is the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America, not in Australia, but it certainly is in North America. Um, I don't even know if they're in Australia, but they're, they're definitely in North America and they're crushing it in North America. They are the easiest and most exciting way to play DFS. It's just you against the uh, against the numbers, Williams. So instead of battling other players or pros or those nasty sharks, all you need to do is pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in it is that simple so football season may be over it's definitely football off season we'll be talking keenan allen later on and i've got some takes a little bit i can't wait to talk about keenan allen but the football season is over but everything on the basketball friends is heating up so whether it's the nba the bulls quest for 500 whether it's the tournament games coming up whatever it might be you can get in on all the excitement with our friends over at prize picks which again is America's number one fantasy sports app where you can turn your hoops knowledge into serious cash, William. So the conference tournaments are here, whether you're into the men's basketball, women's college basketball, whatever it might be, you can earn a lot of dough by playing uh, uh, or, you know, playing the playing all these games over at Price Picks. All you need to do is go to prizepicks.com forward slash CH, CHGO and use code CHGO for a first deposit match up to 100 bucks. Pretty good. That's a pretty good offer. That's uh, prizepicks.com forward slash CHGO when you use code CHGO. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy, William. It is that easy for prize picks. Maybe not that easy for Aya last night, who had a bit of a struggle of a game offensively. Only two for 11 from the field, one for five on threes for seven points. He did have four assists uh, and did get to the line once. But, you know, without Kobe, and this was my big takeaway from the game, which I wrote about in uh, in my post game write up, which is just that like there the the lack of shot creation and offensive um, just creation in general is really lacking without Kobe. And I've been kind of hammering home the idea that I don't think Kobe's necessarily had his best moments of the year as the primary guy. Like he's playing really well off of closeouts, like Demar drawing mm -hmm. to him getting the kick out and then running 
you know, into like those get actions with Vooch where it's like into a handoff pick and roll or just like attacking closeouts, getting downhill, obviously catch and shoot. He's been fantastic, but the Bulls really needed a little bit of offensive juice last night from Aya, which they did not get, um, you know, not to say he like played poorly, but I think it was just an opportunity for him to step into a bigger role. And Billy Donovan said as much after the game, he said, quote, I thought tonight was a great learning experience for Io because I think this was a game where he really could have generated more downhill and maybe tried to create some closeout for some guys, closeouts for some guys. So I think he can really get better from this game. And I totally agree. Like this is I've asked Billy a couple of times about like, are you trying to put the ball in your young guys hands, whether it's Io or whoever, and like trying to massage that question specific to certain guys to like see if the Bulls are at all interested in like developing these guys on the ball. And he's always been really careful to not say that. But so this was the first time where he was like, you know, this was a learning and growing and developing opportunity for IO. And, you know, again, I'm not trying to say that he has been bad or didn't do well, but like, to me, this is the foundation for him to really start to add to his game. Um, he's been fantastic as of late. He's averaging 38 minutes per game over the last 15, 15.3 15 points, 5.3 assists, a steal, on 45, 40, 82 shooting splits, taking 6.1 three-point attempts per game. Um, Mark, do you think, I don't know if you want to talk specific about last night or just bigger picture about Io in general, but like, what have you seen from him growth-wise? And do you feel like Billy's comments made sense as far as like, you know, can he grow into something even more offensively? Or do you feel like this is kind of where he is now? Um, I would say this is where he is. I mean, I don't want to sort of apply a ceiling to it because Io seems like the type of player that will break through ceilings when you apply them. Yeah, that certainly happened for me when I when the Bulls drafted him. I thought he would be something and he's already exceeded that or is already playing at that level this soon into his career. Um, like the level he's at now is probably where I thought maybe his peak would be during his career. So I don't want to say like Io is topped out or he's, he's nearing that because... Who the hell knows? He's still, what, 23, 24 years of age and has taken on more this season, has been better this season. We've seen a lot more offensively. The defense has been really good. And I don't want to be overly critical of last night's game either, not to suggest that you were. Um, but like, whilst it was an opportunity for Io to step into a bigger role and to you know be more of that lead guy in, in some respects, it's also we, we also have to account for the fact that when you take... Well, the reason why he's in that role is because you're taking Kobe out of that role. What you're doing is putting Kobe, uh, sorry, Io out there, but you're not necessarily arming or tooling Io with a lot of options to sort of help him grow as that creator type thing or giving him much, much options from that creation point of view. So it's not like you're just putting Io on ball and then you've got Kobe and Demar sort of roaming off him with Vooch in, in pick and roll sorts of thing as well. Like when Io is being that lead guy, it's often in the, that second unit, second unit moments or when DeMar's off the floor or off ball. So he's ha having to operate with a lot of role guys around him who, as we mentioned before, are probably like your real depth pieces like Julian Phillips, like the team, like Javon Carter, guys that you probably ordinarily wouldn't be playing anyway. So I want to be fair and apply that context too, that even though he's has seen more of those reps, let's say, particularly last night, it's not like he's out there playing with you know, great options, let's say, that can maybe ha make that role or that learning, or that that period of time a little bit easier for him in that sense. But the, the key thing that you noted, like to me, is the fact that he has been playing damn near 40 minutes. It was a back-to-back -back situation last night against a team that has very good perimeter defense. I don't know. I'm just I, I'm not overly critical of what I saw last night. Yeah, the Bulls needed more from Io, but they've been asking a shit on uh, from him. So I'm, I'm prepared to give him a break, I suppose. I don't mean this to be critical at all, like I, yeah, whatsoever. I, know. I, know. Um, I think this is, to me, it's like more of a developmental thing. Like what more can we see him do with the ball in his hands? I think that's really a question. And like I said, I mean, to, to say that he wasn't able to do it last night, so he's not going to be able to do it, I think completely misses the point. Like he, mm -hmm. I think, has shown his ability to attack closeouts. I think him playing around other good players absolutely has an impact. Um, but that was a situation last night where they said, you know, we're going to have Javon and Tori Craig and Alex Cruz out there and they're going to shoot it as soon as they touch it a lot of the time. But we need somebody else to get downhill and create those closeout opportunities for those guys. And, you know, I think that's where Io can really where he still has a lot of room to grow. Like, obviously, he has stepped into a bigger role this season. I think he's become a really, really solid role player. And that's great. Like, that's more than 
I thought he was going to be. He's playing 38 minutes a game over the last 15. Like that's insane. Um, so I think he's been playing really well. And I wrote about it um, in a couple of times this past week, honestly, once was just about his development um, on the ball and how it's like been more than just his shooting. Like we talked a little bit a few weeks ago about, you know, his ability to get shots up at volume, how he feels like teams are defending him a little bit differently now that he's shooting so well and what that is doing for the rest of his game. Um, and then I also wrote about how uh, the Bulls are starting to put him in some more actions to be able to get those closeout opportunities. So um, we're doing a new kind of column idea where I'm going to be diving into some plays and X's and O's and stats and cap stuff to really break stuff down at a granular level. And the first one, these are going to be for diehard subscribers only, but the first one is free to anyone. Um, so go check that out on the site, allchgo.com. But kind of wrote about how the Bulls are using this pistol action to get him these quick handoffs where he can just get downhill. And I think that's kind of what Billy was talking about. Like he really wants to see Io be able to get to the rim, bring help over and make the play. So whether he's finishing uh, over the top or just kicking out for Caruso or Torrey Craig or whoever it is, like I think that is the next step for him. And I think he, not to say he like can't do this, but I think he struggles at times to break guys down off the dribble. And so the Bulls are trying to put him in situations where he can get the step on his guy without necessarily having to do it off the dribble or, you know, get into a mid range situation. Like they want him getting to the rim. And so I think that can really change kind of his ceiling. I think when you put it into the context of who he's playing alongside, it's probably still as a role player, but like if you need, if you're an NBA team trying to play at a high level, you need multiple guys to be able to create with the ball in their hands. And whether that is some of that creation is manufactured or whether it's just that player doing it by himself, like you need something like that in order to um, create downhill movement. And the Bulls have prioritized getting paint touches and kicking it out so much this year. I mean, that's like the source of all their three point shooting. It's a source of their foul drawing, their offensive rebounding. They really want to get into the paint. And so that's what I'm going to be looking for from Io the rest of the way. It's what I think is going to take him from being a really solid role player to maybe a little bit something more. Um, and, you know, that I think is something that he was better at in college than certainly the three point shooting. So the fact that he has developed so much as a shooter, I think the numbers have kind of dipped down a little bit. Recently, he was like over 50% for a stretch. Um, so it is coming down, but 6.1 attempts per game is fantastic. That's what I want to continue to see from him. And I feel like that can really raise his ceiling and who he is as a player. Yeah, well, look, I mean, ultimately, the, the the main difference, or not the main difference, but a key difference between good players and great players and, uh, you know, role guys and stars, particularly on offense is, you know, you can boil it down to a lot of different ways. But for me, like a key thing is like, what's your ability to uh, cre create an advantage versus, you know, taking advantage of an advantage. And that last piece is what IO has been doing very well when DeMar and IO, uh, sorry, DeMar, Kobe or whomever has sort of created an opportunity, created a lane, created space, whatever it might be. Io has been fantastic this, uh, this year at finishing and taking advantage of those players. But what you're asking or what you're suggesting, what Billy was talking about last night, the role that Io was in last night was, all right, well, can you create the advantage both for yourself or for your teammates? And like, that's, that's the next step, assuming he can get to that step. That step is freaking hard. Like not many players can actually do that in the league. And that's why... There are so few great offensive players. Like there's a lot of players that can finish baskets. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of players that can go off for 20, 25, 30. But like how many of those players that are doing that are doing that because they're creating those points themselves or their reliance on others to maybe get maybe half of those points. And the minute they, they're asked to do a little bit more or their roll upscales or whatever it might be, do the context of their situation changes their output? Like I think that's what we're seeing or potentially could see from Io if Kobe's out for an extended run. So like that's the that's the key thing. But as you were talking, like like that pistol action as an example, like that's the perfect type of play where you try to get Io on the move, try to get him connected with a DHO, something like that, where he's on ball in in some respects, but because you're using others to to help him get on ball, to help him create that advantage, like you're helping I heard create that advantage for him to get downhill to take advantage of that situation. So it's kind of a, a middle of the road solution, I suppose. You, you know, it's he's taking advantage of what has been created for him, but he's also involved on the in the on ball action to initiate something as well. So 
the way they're using him makes complete sense to me, either on or off ball. Obviously, with Kobe out, we're going to see him, him you know, see him more on uh, in on ball situations. But like I said before, like it's just contextually different as well. Like him being in on ball scenarios with this current team versus being on in on ball scenarios whereby he's got real options around him as well. Like that changes the context too. So, um, but ultimately, like this is good reps. And what we've seen from Kobe, what we've seen from Io, they both continue to develop. They both continue to exceed my expectations. Um, and the way that Io has been playing this season, like he looks like a guy that could be a fourth or fifth starter on a good team, which, again, is not something that I necessarily thought coming into this season that we'd be saying about Io. So uh, anything else that he does from this point, William, is absolutely gravy from my, my standpoint because he's already given us more than I possibly could have expected. And that's kind of exactly what we wanted to see this season too right like that's what we wanted to get out of this season once all the zach stuff happened and even before that i mean we were both pretty much more interested in the future outlook and figuring out which players were a part of the next bulls team than what actually happens this year and now we're getting to see that and so obviously kobe has really taken a step forward and i think he's you mentioned like the difference between um you know being able to take advantage of a, a shot that was created for you versus creating that shot for yourself. And like Kobe, I think still better at taking advantage of the shot created for you, which is a great skill to have really important. But I think he's also taken huge strides forward in being a shot creator himself. And then the, the level after that is now can you create shots for other people too? And Kobe has just taken a huge step forward in both of those. So um, IO, I think has taken a huge step forward this year as somebody who you know, takes advantage of shots created for him. And now, like you said, perfectly, um, it's just more about, can he now create those shots for himself and start to create them for others? And I don't think that him not getting to that point this year is a bad thing because he's made such big strides. Um, but I do think that we're just going to have to, I'm excited to sort of see if we can start to find that out because it's going to be a process. It's going to take some time, but I think with reps, with the amount of work that he does, and like the confidence that he has, I think is really going to push him forward. Like, I just, I can't say enough about how much more confident he seems as a player right now with the jump shot, just like his presence, like in the locker room from what little we get to see. I mean, he just, he feels like a different guy in there. And I think he really believes in himself and the work that he's put in. And, um, you know, Fish is saying he's got length. He's a good two-way guy. I think he could do it. Um, you know, he mentioned Kobe's floater. Like I think Io's in between game is something that he has gotten to a little bit more lately. He's got that floater. He can kind of finish up and under. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty excited about what we're seeing from him. And I think it also kind of speaks to the, to the idea that, you know, that there does need to be someone there to help create that advantage for him. And yeah, you said it totally before fine. that. Yeah. Totally fine. You said it before the uh, trade deadline, and it's really stuck with me that like unless they have an alternative for Demar, then they shouldn't trade Demar. They shouldn't move on from him because they really need somebody to draw to create that mm -hmm. offense. Um, we're seeing a little bit from Vooch last night. I was actually kind of surprised that the Clippers weren't just like playing Vooch and um, and Demar straight up and like letting everybody else beat them. They were really still sending two um, and mm -hmm. giving up a lot of threes. So I thought that was interesting, but um, it shows the value of those guys. It shows the importance of drawing two and kicking out and now taking advantage. And um, obviously that's going to have huge implications for this summer and what the Bulls decide to do with DeMar. And we're going to talk about that next. Uh, but first, Mark, can you tell the listeners about our friends at Coors? Yes, William, I can. Glad I got this read today because I need a beer. Um even though the Bulls haven't been stressing me out more more recently, the Bulls have been playing some good basketball. You know, it's always beer time, particularly down here, down under, where it's going to be, what, like 89 degrees Fahrenheit or whatever the conversion is for you guys. It's going to be hot, is the point. So when I'm sitting down later to watch some NBA, breaking down Keenan Allen tape, whatever it might be doing, I'm going to be doing so with a cause light in my hand. But also, William, I've got some yard work to do today. I need to get out there and mow the lawn. I need to, you know do some other stuff out the back, clean that whole thing up. And wait, I just can't wait. Fest? What was that? Sorry. Is it stump fest? I have no idea what stump fest is. Oh, come on. That's what? a bluey reference. That's you have a small child and you're from Australia. You should totally know. 
He's ruining my flow in this great ad read, this this pristine ad read talking about Bluey. Come on, LB. Come on. Anyways, getting back to it, the point being, <laughs> it's going to be a situation, William, where I'm going to be hot and sweaty and not an ideal image for people listening to this. I apologize. But Seriously. after after mowing the lawn, I'm just going to be sitting there on my porch, beer in hand, cause light in hand. Sitting there looking the out the backyard, just looking at that pristine lawn with a cause light in my hand, a cool, refreshed cause light, the perfect way to chill down after doing some hard yakker out the back. So I can't wait to do that. And anyone else who wants to beer, then I suggest doing so, um, getting a cause, in, cause light in your hand and feeling better about yourself. Helping the cause light will just help you chill out. And if you want to do so, if you want to get cause light delivered straight to your, this is the best part. You don't have to do anything. All you need to do is just go to Instacart, go to causelight.com um, for slash CHGO basketball, and you can get Cause Light delivered straight to your door. How easy is that? The hell? <laughs> My God. So if you want to celebrate responsibly, uh, Cause is the brewing company that you do it with. Get yourself a Cause Light beer. Like I said, use, use Instacart, jump online, causelight.com forward slash CHGO basketball, and you can also be downing a sweet, refreshing beer, just like I will be doing later today. Not watching Bluey. But just sitting out the back, enjoying the sunset with the beer in hand. Ah, I can't wait. So I mean, picture lost, this. Great show. <laughs> picture this. You're sitting on your couch after mowing your lawn at 8.30 on a Saturday morning in Australia. You got your Coors Light in hand. And then you think to yourself, you know, I could really use some new flooring in my place. Well, look no further <laughs> than Empire today because Definitely you can shop at home with the convenience of your own home. For the right products for your needs that come with quick and professional installation and a low price guarantee, they want to provide the most bestest and most efficientest service possible. May not be the most affordable, but that's because they prioritize quality and beating out their copycats on quality service speed. And competitors are probably going to lo uh, advertise lower pro quality products, but Empire simply is not going to carry those lower quality products because they value putting the floors in your house that they would put in their own home. And they keep shopping floors so simple with their curated product selection. You can use their virtual floor designer, which is a great way to see how the new floors look in any space. You, It's super easy. You just snap a picture and instantly see how your new, new floor looks. I'm not sure if you can get a picture of yourself on the couch, sweaty after mowing the lawn with the Coors in hand into that uh, virtual floor designer product that the empire folks have so i'm going to have to check back in on that one but it's much better than shopping for a floor at a big box store where you're gonna probably run into somebody who was working in plumbing yesterday but flooring is all empire today does they live and breathe it so you can be confident you're getting honest and upfront advice plus they pride themselves in their convenient shop at home service they help you shop floors where they use their floors so they can see exactly what those new floors will look like in your home's lighting and decor and help you make the informed decision that you need. They also service their own warranties. So if you have an issue, you just call Empire. You don't have to track down any manufacturer phone numbers. They warranty it all themselves. So schedule a free in-home estimate today. All listeners can receive $350 off when they use promo code CHGO. That's right, $350 off, promo code CHGO, restrictions apply, see empiretoday.com slash CHGO for details. All right, Mark, let's move on here to uh, some bigger picture stuff because that's what we love to do here on these HQ episodes. And I wanted to plug our diehard subscribers only Discord channel. I was in there this morning chatting with some of our friends, Gus G, AJ, it's a baseball kid. Um, who else was in there? Brooms, Mr. Jelly, Austin, uh, having some good conversation about the Bulls. And I asked them if they had any questions. So I wanted to bring those up special for our Discord, Discord members only. So if you want to get in there in that conversation with me and Mark and Matt and Dave, uh, make sure you check out the All CHGO website to learn more about becoming a diehard. But they asked some really good questions. And we discussed that a little bit, but I wanted to pose them to you on the show and this one i just let's dive right into it because this is i think the the question that most bulls fans are interested in hearing about these days this is from aj on our discord um he said this may be too broad or too subjective of a question but what should i want 
to happen with this team. Things being as they are now, it seems like re-signing DeMar and the continued development of Ion Kobe would be enough to truly move the needle into legitimate contendership. Is it getting Zach and Lonzo's money off the books for more flexibility to build in free agency? Or is it the only way, or is the only way out of this hoping to lose enough games next season that management throws in the towel and hopes for lottery luck? Is there any light at the end of the tunnel? Ooh, that's heavy because I mean, that's basically all the chicken littling we've been doing for the past three years um, in one question. And, you know, I think it's totally fair. Like I, we, we had you um, kind of give your thoughts about this a couple of shows ago, just talking about how this, like these games are fun. It's nice to see DeMar taking over in these clutch moments. Kobe and I have shown growth this year, but at the end of the day, they still are the ninth seed. They're still not a 500 team. Their upside this year so far seems to be uh, a first round series with Boston, who for all intents and purposes is going to sweep them. Um, and they don't have, it's not like a lot of money is coming off the books. They've still got DeMar's contract to figure out. Um, what like what do you want to happen with this team? And what, what do you think people should want? Obviously, we're not going to tell you how to feel. I think Matt says this all the time, and I think it's really true. Like you can Bulls fan, how, however you Bulls fan, I don't want to necessarily tell you what to think, but also you and I have opinions about this. So what's yours? Yeah. I mean, I have a lot of thoughts on this and it's a good question. Shouts to AJ for, for, um, for asking it up in discord. Appreciate you. Um, as we do all our discord diehards. Um, I guess we have to start. I did, this is the, the trouble with this conversation is it's so contextual and you almost need to lay down so many caveats just to understand what the right answer should be, assuming there is a right answer. And I guess that's the first part. Like there is no right answer. What you want may be different to what I want. What I want, I can deem is right and fair. What you want is maybe right and fair too. Like it's it's it is subjective. Like AJ, that, like one of his first words in his question is it is is the fact that it's a subjective question, and that's true. It is a hundred percent subjective. So if you want to get rid of Demar. If you wanted to trade him either at this deadline, previous deadlines, if you want to let him walk in the in, in our free in free agency, sign and trade, whatever the situation may be, like you're not wrong to want that. You're not wrong to think that that's the right decision because it very may well be. Similarly, I think people who want Demar back, who and I've been one of those people for a long time now. I've, as you noted before, like I've floated the idea that they shouldn't just trade him just to trade him, um, particularly if the return isn't significant. Because I think he does have real on-court value, not just for the winning side of things, but for more importantly, the development of guys like Kobe and Io. Like we talked about before about Io being able to excel in the role he is right now. But like the, part of the reason why he's able to excel in that role is because he has guys ahead of him who can create that advantage for him. One of those guys creating said advantage is DeMar DeRozan. If you take him out, then you're asking more of Kobe to be that on-ball guy, that be that ISO guy, which isn't his game. You're then asking um, someone like Io to be a creator, a primary creator, which, as we've seen, probably not his game either. So it puts them in a tough situation if you just remove DeMar. Now, having said that, again, another thing I've said previously, if you've got an alternative for DeMar, if you've got a path to replacing DeMar and you can do so this offseason and it makes sense to do so, then do that, I guess. But until you do, until you have that alternative uh, solution, just know that if you remove Demar from the situation, things are going to be a lot worse. A lot. I could. I can't stress this enough. How bad it's going to be if you just take out Demar and don't replace him. It's going to be terrible. Uh, it's going to put too much pressure on uh, on Kobe and Io. You're going to be asking much more of Vooch to be a creator, a central piece of the offense, which I don't love the thought of that. And then you're probably asking for even more from other guys, the, the role players, the Carusos, and those sorts of players to do even more, which again could be problematic. So there is no right or wrong answer to this. Um, maybe that's not a great answer from my side. I, 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 maybe it's not great podcasting, but it, it is so case by case dependent. Like as an example, like if you hit on your 2024 draft pick, you draft a creator in, in this upcoming draft and that player, you know, exceeds expectations. Like if you happen to get your hands on the next Tyrese Halliburton or, you know, a player like that, say the Bulls finish 12th in this draft. And you get a Halliburton level player. Maybe it's not a point guard, but maybe it's a wing, whatever it might be. Someone that can come in and again, add to this young developing core. Then contextually, like that changes the demand conversation. But if that doesn't happen, then that also changes the demand conversation. So uh, one thing I'm trying to be better about, William, is not being absolute in my takes. 
because we shouldn't be because so much of this is so conditional and contextual based on all the other variables that are around us. So I don't have a good answer for this because there isn't a good answer. There isn't a one right answer. It is subjective, as AJ said. Like I've always said, I'm okay with keeping DeMar. I think he adds value. But if you've got an alternative for DeMar, a more cost-effective alternative, a younger alternative, then do that too. But let's see, I guess is my point. Yeah, it's such an interesting question. I think you know we can sit here and try to project how much we think uh, the Bulls will spend on DeMar and maybe we can do that now, but um, it's just like, I think there's a couple ways to look at it. You can look at it through the lens of like what you would want to happen in a total vacuum. You can look at it through the perception of what you think they're going to do and what their goals are based on what their actions have been. Um, right now, if the Bulls were unable to move Zach Levine this summer, which I think will be true, if you're unable to medically retire at Lonzo Ball this summer, which I think will be true, and no other major roster moves are made. If you project the Bulls to have the 14th pick in the draft, they will have $36 million to spend on Patrick Williams, DeMar DeRozan, and Andre Drummond to just run it back next year. $36.95 million. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know that you can give DeMar what he's going to want and also bring back Patrick and Drummond in that situation. I, I just don't know that that's possible. So I think the first thing is like, are they going to be able to trade Zach this summer? Can you find some flexibility in other ways? Maybe you move Javon Carter, that opens up some space. Um, maybe you can move Zach, but I just think it's going to be difficult to do that at this point. I also think DeMar has probably played himself not only into a situation of complete leverage against the Bulls front office, um, based on his play, based on the fact that they didn't trade him, that they played their hand effectively and, and said, look, we're not going down no matter what. So like this is exactly what happened with Vooch last year. You're going to have to pay him more than the rest of the market would to retain them because you value their skill set more than anybody else. It's not a situation where you say, all right, what's the highest bidder? We'll give you $1 more. Uh, Damar, you want to go to the Lakers for the mid-level exception? Fine. We'll offer you $13.1 million instead of 13. Um, it's not going to work that way. Uh, first of all, I think Damar recognizes that the Bulls are the only situation in which he's going to be able to dominate the ball the way that he does. That he's going to be able to take whatever shots he wants the way that he does and that he will continue to be able to be like this clutch hero and, you know, really important person in a franchise. Like, I'm not sure he's ready in his career, not to say that I like have any insider info on this, but just based on you know who he is, I can't imagine him saying, I'm ready to take a step back so that I can title chase or ring chase or whatever with the Lakers or whoever um, for $5 million, $10 million a year. I just don't really see that at this point in his career because I think he probably believes that he's got five or six more years left. I think he thinks he can play till he's 40. And the way he plays, like maybe he can. I think he is sliding a little bit, but all this to say, like he's still in a great position against the Bulls to negotiate as much as he can. So I feel like $30 million is what I'm kind of expecting. I could see maybe a little bit more. I think the years will be interesting. I think years will be important to DeMar. Mm -hmm. And look, I mean, he's 30, he's 35 going into next season. Like he's not going to want a one year deal because then it's another prove it. He's going to want a little bit more security where he can say, look what I've given you. Look how important I am to this franchise. Look how important I am to the development of Kobe and IO and making sure this franchise doesn't completely go in the gutter as soon as I leave. Like you need to pay me $30 million a year over three years, or you need to pay me $33 million a year over three years. Like three for 100 is not out of the realm of possibility. But then what does that mean for Patrick? And what does that mean for, um, you know, Drummond, who again, I think is crazy that they didn't trade uh, backup center who they're going to lose in free agency for a second round pick they're really valuing him and maybe they figure out a way to bring him back, but that would require some other moves to be made. So, you know, I think you're right that like, you can't just let him walk for a couple of different reasons. I mean, you can, if you want to just like go the other direction, but since they're unwilling to do that, I just don't think they're in a position where they can let that happen. And so they're going to have to find flexibility in other ways. The ways to do that are moving off of Zach for, you can't even get expiring salary at that point. You need to get cap relief, cap space. Um, you need to send him into cap space so that you can uh, re-sign DeMar. Um, 
which is a tough task. And that's another reason why, you know, just salary dumping him at the last deadline made some sense because now you can't even, you, you can't even like get expiring salary back to where you have more space this off season when you need it. Um, so Lonzo, I think is another option. We'll see what happens with him. Um, but you have these really good contracts in Caruso in Kobe in IO that you, you like, you can afford to spend up, but you need to have the right positions, the right players around them to be able to do it. And I think DeMar is clearly the best that they're going to be able to find in free agency this summer. Um, even if they let him walk, it's not like they have a ton of space. So like considering that, like what, what do you think is like the three year plan from there? Cause to me, that's like the bigger question. It's not necessarily about losing DeMar for nothing or keeping him or letting him walk or whatever. It's like, what does that say about the three to five year plan and the window beyond just this upcoming season? I think this front office has gotten a little bit too much, if not way too much into the weeds of the day to day and aren't really thinking big picture about the long term health um, and development of the organization. Um, obviously, like I said, DeMar is helping Iowa and Kobe grow, but you basically have two more years after this one where those guys are on good deals and then you're going to have to pay up for them too. And probably Zach and Lonzo will be off the books by then. But again, you're in kind of a tricky spot where, you know, Vooch and Kobe and Io are all lined up. And if you give DeMar that third year, now you're almost kind of locking yourself back into the same core for not just two years, not just three years, but probably beyond that. Well, I mean, they can't because, I mean, what, tomorrow will be like 37, 38 at that point <clears throat> in two or three years' time. Fooch will be 35, 36. So by that proxy alone, they can't really lock themselves into it. I mean, they can, but maybe they shouldn't. Um, but, I I mean, the plan is what the plan has always been. It's to be competitive. And I'm mocking AK in that situation, but with Io and Kobe breaking out the way they have, in addition to, you know, Julian Phillips becoming a, a potential player. I think Pat still has some room to grow. If you hit on that 2024 pick, like there's the path to being a decent 40 to 45 win team. Again, it'll look different. It'll be a Kobe led team. Um, but think about how they got Lonzo, how they got DeMar. Like the Bulls still have a path to get that level of free agent in future years to add to Kobe and Io, et cetera. Now they can't do that, obviously, if they re up. Vooch and Damar again, as you noted. But if for whatever reason they part ways with them, they regroup in what what would that be? 26, 2026 or 2027 around that that around that time frame and bring bring three bring through rather the new version of Damar and the new version of Vooch, whatever it may be, whatever it might look like. There's still that path there for them to do what they've always been doing, which is just try to be a good, respectable basketball team that can win 40 to 45 games, a team that will uh, sell out the United Center and a team that will, um, yeah, will be there or thereabouts. Like that is the goal. That is the plan. So I, I don't I don't agree with this idea that they don't have a plan. I think that's very clear that they do have a plan. They don't have a plan to be more than what I just stated, Yeah, but that's never been the goal. It's it's not the goal. But I, I push back against this idea that they don't have a plan. They do. We hate the plan. We think that plan fucking sucks. But that doesn't mean that plan doesn't exist. So I think there is that plan. And I think they're very fortunate as well that Kobe and Io are sort of enabling that plan or to connect that plan, I suppose, or connect those years. This would have been very problematic for AK if Kobe had not broken out, uh, if Io had not developed the way he has, because then the situation does look a lot more bleak. And you are questioning whether that next group can keep you competitive. But I do think now there is a reasonable path to be competitive going forward. Like I said, all you need is Kobe and Io. If you hit on your 2024 pick, um, maybe you retain your 2025 pick. Maybe it doesn't go to San Antonio. Maybe you, you you nail that draft. If you can sign a couple of decent free agents um, and can come in like your next versions of Lonzo, Caruso, Damar, etc., then you can be a 40 to 45 win team very easily. Like we continuously say, the easiest thing to do in the NBA is to be a 40 to 45 win team. I, I, I'm convinced that they can do that again. And that is the plan. That has always been the plan. And if the plan is to do the easy thing every single time, then I, I, I think they're going to do that. So that would be my expectation. That's what we should be expecting. Um, I know that sounds doom and gloom and potentially it is if you have grander plans, but the Bulls have been very clear about who they are and what their goals are. And I think... 
you know, you said that is the plan. Um, and there's no, there's nothing more than that. And I think that's the part that is like the most true. Um, mm -hmm. cause I think that like, you know, these, a lot of people are saying like, they don't care about being good, whatever. Like, I think they do care about that. They're just not willing to like make the tough decisions that get them to championship contention. And I think the way that they played just continues to reinforce and especially against the teams that they played well against reinforces this idea that they don't need to be doing the Sam Hinky or Sam Presti like collect picks and be good for many years and like build a sustainable winner. They don't need to do that because all these teams are pretty bad and mediocre and they're like on the low end of that. Probably um, the way that they played, they like Zach Levine said this last year and I think it's just so absolutely true. It's like, we've shown we can beat anybody and we've also shown we can get beaten by anybody. And like, that's, that's what they're going for. Like they think if they make it through the play in and maybe with the exception of like the Celtics and maybe the bucks that like they can give a first round team a run for their money and maybe make the second round. And if they get a good draw, then maybe they can make the conference finals. Like I, I really believe that that's who they think that they are. And maybe that's right. Like these teams aren't that good. None of these teams are really that scary. I think they're better than the bulls, but I do think if you put the bulls in a clutch situation with Demar, they're probably going to have a good chance to win as proven by all the clutch wins. Now, is that the same as you still kind of should be looking towards how do you win a championship and how do you build something that can be a little bit more sustainable? And should you be thinking longer term and should you be developing young players and accumulating draft capital so that you can, do those things absolutely but um yeah why mess with a good thing as long as it's good enough um so I, I agree with you i think they are kind of doing exactly that was my takeaway from post trade deadlines like everybody wants them to like have a plan to pick a lane they've picked it they've decided this is their plan this is what they're trying to be and they're succeeding the problem is do we agree with that part of it do we agree with what they're trying to be and obviously the answer to that is no but um yeah, I mean, I, I also think that, like, you know, in, in this question, like, is there a light at the end of the tunnel? I don't think it's wrong to think that they can compete with the Knicks or the Magic or the Pacers in a first round series if they get one with them or in a playing game if they get there. So I think that there's going to be competitive basketball ahead. I think the the goal of AK's goal to like just do enough is happening. And that's why I don't think anything major is going to be changing. So um, this is kind of a, a variation of the question from Brooms in mm -hmm. the Discord uh, channel. He said, what happens when AK extends to Mars Ox season? Are we trading off of money? Is Vooch out of here? What do the numbers look like? Uh, given Zach is still probably on the roster. That's kind of what I was talking about with the $39 yeah. million to be able to bring all these guys, uh, th $37 million, excuse me, to be able to bring these guys back. Well, um, on that point too, like they can, I'm not suggesting they do this, but they can open up money pretty easily with the waving and stretching Lonzo. Like that's another option that exists. And you can free up $13 million pretty easily by doing so. Maybe not the best way to do so. Maybe not the best idea. But if for whatever reason you can't move Zach, if you can't trade him, if you can't open more money to, or more breathing space on, under that salary cap line, then that's the, the nuclear option, let's say, that if you wave and stretch Lonzo, um, his his contract would count against the books for seven ish million. Um, he, you you would have a cap hit for Lonzo in the in the seasons thereafter for about seven million for two two seasons thereafter. So it's not ideal from that standpoint, but you can create room pretty easily if you wanted to. So I'm not too concerned about the money. I think you can make make the money work. I think AK when he was smug about that piece at his post trade uh, trade deadline talk uh, not talk uh, what's an impressor. Um, I understand why he was smug in some senses. Maybe it was connected to having a Zach Levine trade lined up. But if it's not, then like I said, you do have that ability to create some more some, some more um, breathing room from a cap point of view if you wave and stretch Alonzo, which again, might not be the best strategy, but it's an option. Yeah, and I think it'll be interesting to see if they kind of uh, admit defeat on that one because they've been so adamant about getting him back this whole time and him how yeah. important he was to them playing well so same with zach i mean i think they keep saying we're better with him they've clearly proven that they can play well without him not to say they're better or worse with him but they've proven they can be competitive without him and so if you can get off that money bring in some other guys for a different kind of you know attack whether it's like you know floor spacing or a big or whatever it may be like i think they have some optionality it's just a matter of can they find or do they do 
you know, what they need to do in terms of adding an asset to get off of Zach, to be able to keep on going with this group. Um, before we wrap up here, we got one final question from the discord. It's for big football knower, comma, huge bears fan, MK hoops from Alexander Faripas. Have Mark K break down the Keenan Allen trade. Mark, go. Wow. Look, I didn't, th- I wanted to stick strictly to balls today because I was listening to post game last night and, uh, I think Matt and Dave covered the Bulls game last night for uh, literally for two minutes. So there was an hour show and two minutes of it was the Bulls related. The rest was Keenan Allen talk. So I'll, I was just trying to stick to the Bulls today. But um, look, if the people want to get my Bears takes, I'm more than willing to oblige. And a, a thing that people don't know, William, and I'm going to let I'm going to let people into a uh, you know, I'm going to take them behind the scenes. Let's say everyone thinks about Adam Hogue and Nick Mariano as like the, the go-to guys for our beat news. No one, no one thinks that about Braggsy or Calm, unfortunately. Sorry, guys. But de- they definitely do from a Mariano and Hogue point of view, right? But little do people know that Hogue and Mariano, they're always in my in, in my DMs. They're always asking me my thoughts about football because I am ghostwriting a lot of their thoughts. Let's just say that. Um, I'm a big, big Bears guy. Everyone knows big that. I'm a big, knower. big, big NFL guy. Um, I know a lot about football and I know a lot about Keenan Allen Williams. Age 31, just a terrific wide receiver is the position he plays. <laughs> I also know that he had over 1,200 yards last season in reception or receiving yards. Uh, to, to get that guy who had his second highest in total receiving yards last season, yeah, there's been some injury concerns in, in years prior, but to get him for a fourth-round pick, a fourth-round pick, to now put him in next to DJ Moore, Whoever's playing with uh, quarterback, whoever that might be, let's not name names because I know that's a a contentious issue, but whoever's going to be throwing that damn football to those wide receivers, which is a position in the NFL, that person's going to have a good time because he's got options to throw the ball to now. And then when you add in the DeAndre Swift, who's a, I believe, a running back, and uh, Cole Kmet, who's a tight end, and um, some other guy named Gerald Everett as well, like that is... An offense. I'm seeing an offense for shape itself, and then I'm th- I'm thinking that's a I'm thinking that's a top fifteen offense, William. At least at minimum, maybe top ten. So whoever this Bears quarterback is going to be, and I believe the Bears traded for a quarterback too, but it's not um you know a third stringer or something like that. But whoever that player is going to be, I'm just saying he's got some options to throw that throw that ball to. He's going to be throwing some darts to some key key receivers. DJ Moore is the number one option. Keenan Allen is your second. Maybe you draft a wide receiver as well. Here's the other thing. Maybe you trade down and maybe you keep a an unnamed Bears quarterback to, to be playing that quarterback position. Maybe you trade down, you, you draft a wide receiver, you get in that third receiver to be a development project to learn from DJ Moore and Keenan Allen. What, what an ideal setup that is, William. So I'm, I'm ecstatic about this. Fourth round peak for Keenan Allen. This is an A-plus trade. Absolutely A plus trade. Ryan Pohl's making more trades than Arturis Karnaschovas has in three years. I love it. I love it. You heard it here first. Wide receiver is a position in the NFL, <laughs> and that is Mark's analysis on football. <laughs> Thank everybody for tuning in. We appreciate the <laughs> chatter in the comments. Uh, uh, just uh, Friday afternoon, 4.30 p.m. <laughs> you guys hanging out with us. It means the world. Mark, uh, always a pleasure talking with you. Lawrence, we appreciate you hanging around with us here for this nonsense. And <laughs> the Bulls have a game tomorrow, I believe, uh, against the Washington Wizards of Washington. Um, they also have a football team there called the Commanders, which mm-hmm. is uh, in the NFL, the National Football League. They have Correct. the second overall pick in the draft. Uh, they have wide receivers on their team and wide receiver is a position in football so good on them and we will be back to break down the game against the washington wizards tomorrow night afterwards matt and dave hut hut hike as mark says and we will see you all next time